the control My soul is untouchable Because you've already won me My victory is not in this flesh and bone It's in the cross and I know Nobody's taking it from me I got my armor now No fear, no doubt Can't shoot me down, yeah I got my armor now No fear, no doubt Gonna shoot me down, 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 down Good morning, church. Hey, let's stand and worship this morning. Come on, let's get those hands together.
Tristan. And welcome to The Bridge. We just want to say that we're so glad that you joined us today. Here at The Bridge, there's a perfect place for you to get connected. Whether you're in the building or watching church online, we'd love it if you'd fill out a connect card at thebridgemaryville.com. Just tap connect card on your phone to get started. And while you're here, you can also submit any prayer requests, find notes on today's messages, and take any next step as part of today's service. How cool is that? Bridge is all about loving God and loving people. That's right, and we really hope you feel like family today because we are so happy that you're here. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the family. family. Good morning, church. Oh. oh, check. Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, church. How are we? <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Okay. Oh, perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, hi, my name's Tristan. I'm the student ministries pastor today. Um, and I've got a couple of awesome announcements for you that are going to take place here shortly. The first one I want to talk about is Small Group Sunday will be August 29th. Um, and so we would love to have leaders kind of lead those small groups. And so we just ask that you prayerfully consider um, what God is asking you to do in that role. Um, it sounds kind of intimidating, I'll be honest. Me and my now wife led one when we were college students, and it was awesome. Um, we got to really connect with people in our church, meet people that we don't normally get to see every day. Um, it was just a time to come together once a week and just come together as a body of Christ and do life together. And so we just encourage you to prayerfully consider doing that. If you have any questions of what that looks like, or if you're already like, you know, God's already led me to that, I'd love to lead a small group. We would encourage you to talk to Courtney. Um, she's kind of our small group leader, leader, if that makes sense. So if you have any questions, reach out to Courtney. Um, next on the list is VBS is going to be August 1st through the 4th. 
Um, our VBS program is super awesome. It's awesome to see everything that Mark is doing to prepare for this. Um, really awesome thing that they're doing, though, that I'm excited to see is they're doing a service project where they're going to be stuffing backpacks with school supplies to give out to those in the community. So with that, we are needing some school supplies to help fill those backpacks. You'll see a list of what we're needing on your bulletin. You can drop it off with a tote in the front, or if you forgot to bring it with you today, you can drop it off in, the, in our church office in the back any point throughout this week. Um, August 20th is going to be our back to school bash um, for our bridge youth, which is anyone in high school and middle school. Uh, just kind of a time for us to say goodbye to the summer and hello to the upcoming school year. Really cool thing we're doing there is we're actually going to be tie-dyeing um, Bridge Youth t-shirts, which is why I'm modeling that for you guys today. Um, we do ask that you would uh, pre-order a shirt. You can do that on our website, or we have a table out front. If you want to get it done today, you're more than welcome to. T-shirts are five bucks. Um, they'll come in as white, and your student will be able to tie-dye and customize them however they want to. And then this Friday, we're also doing a citywide scavenger hunt for our youth program. Um, we ask that you RSVP because I've got a lot of like big visions for this. It's going to be a really great time. Um, I'm wanting to build teams. I need to make sure I have enough adult drivers to drive our students around. And so if your student is interested in attending that, it again is this Friday. You can let us know you're coming at thebridgemaryville.com. And so um, we also have a couple other things that you, you'll see in your announcements. I'd encourage you to read over that, as well as on our website. Um, but if the ushers want to prepare to receive offering, I'm going to pray over the offering, and then we're going to follow right back into worship. So you want to join me in prayer. God, we just thank you so much um, for being a God who does a lot with a little, um, a God who's in the business of multiplying. Um, God, we just ask for your hand over this offering. We ask that you bless it as we have multiple projects um, in this church as we want to reach many ministries and reach the lost, Father. Um, we, we ask that you remind our hearts that this money is not ours, but we are simply holding it, and it is for you and your use. And so, God, we ask that you just bless this offering, be present in this offering, and give us the wisdom on how to go about with this offering. God, we love and we praise you. It's in your amazing son's name we pray. Amen. Yo, yeah. 
rejoice as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom.
Father, for this time of worship, to be in your presence, Father. Father, we desire you, we want you, we need you, and I pray that we'd be on fire for you, Lord. We look more like you, speak more like you, think more like you, Father. I pray that we would desire to be more like you. Thank you for this space, these people for sacrificing your son on the cross for us, Father. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you today and have you with us. And uh, we are continuing in our series called Bodybuilding. And so we're going to keep going with this uh, one of the reasons I like series is you're hearing some of the same stuff every week. And I sometimes feel bad like I'm repeating myself, but what I like about that is it implants it in our minds and we're reminded of who we are as the church. 
Some of the things we've talked about is our core in bodybuilding. Uh, and again, when we're talking about bodybuilding, we're talking about the body of Christ, the church. And uh, we've talked about the core. We've talked about conditioning. Last week, we began to stretch, uh, being willing to go beyond maybe what we're comfortable with. And this week, we're going to talk about reps. Reps, which are repetition. Uh, you, you pick a, a muscle in the body and you do certain things with that muscle. You repeat that same thing over and over and over as you're building the muscle in that area. And so one of the things I want to do, and the reason we're going to call this reps, is we want to keep to this same simple message. Um, again, I don't know if it's maybe how loud I am, but I hear a little bit of a ring up here when I get to certain spots. So I just thought I'd let you know that. But uh, in bodybuilding, in reps, uh, you're really building that part of that muscle. And really, when it comes to the church, we're not about being big and bulky. We're about being healthy and uh, strong. That's what we want in our church body. And I believe we are. But that's what we're talking about over this, over this time of doing this bodybuilding series is about being a healthy, strong church. It's not about belief in traditions. It's not a belief in how we worship or the, the worship band that we have and the way we worship. It's not a belief in liturgy. There's four simple things that I want you to understand today. These are going to be our reps that we're going to do over and over and over to build a strong, healthy body. And that is this. Christ died for us. He was buried, he raised, and he appeared. And we're going to find this in Scripture today. If you know, we've been in the book of Acts for the last four weeks. I'm probably going to take this to next Sunday, and then we're going to conclude this series next Sunday. But um, for this week, we're doing reps. And again, it's about Christ died for us. He was buried. He was raised. He appeared. Those four things should just keep in your mind all the time. Those are your reps. That's just what you're, you're thinking about all the time. It's very easy to get distracted when we're in church, to think, well, I don't go to that church because they don't do it this way, or I'm not part of that church. Really, the church is not a building. It's the body of Christ. We are the church. We're not just the bridge. We're the church. And so one thing we want to keep in mind is keep it simple. Anybody ever heard the, the, the phrase kiss? 1960, the U.S. Navy actually is noted for developing that. Keep it simple, stupid. That sounds so mean, doesn't it? But sometimes we have to remind ourselves, keep it simple. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He raised and he appeared. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to keep it simple with this principle and just do these reps of reminding ourselves over and over and over. If you're not able to quote scripture, maybe you don't even own a Bible. If you can accept those four things, you're in. That's what we learned from the very first church the first century church. So I want you to turn your, your Bibles to the book of Acts. We're going to continue there. And we're going to be today in Acts chapter 8. So if you want to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 8, I have to recap because not everybody's here every week. So I like to kind of keep people up to speed on what we're doing. So in this series, we've been in the book of Acts asking the question, how did the church, how did that movement or that gathering of people in the first century make it to the 21st century. And we've studied that the last few weeks. We've seen some pretty important people who got it to this point. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be called the church today. And so we asked the questions, how did that happen? So as we began, if you remember, the first week we talked about the first day of the church when Peter delivered a message. 3,000 people accepted this idea that Christ died on the cross for us, he was buried, he was raised, and he appeared. Those things, they believed, so therefore they were in. But they didn't just go for salvation, they even were baptized on that day. 3,000 people. The next week we talked about Peter and John on the way to the temple. It's a few weeks later, and they're on their way to pray, and they stop at the gate of the temple, and there's a beggar, and Peter says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk, and he heals a man. This created a stir in the temple. People began to gather around. This is that dude that's been lame since birth and he's walking around. And because of that, Peter delivers another message. A couple thousand more people are coming to Christ in that moment. So, so at that point, we've got five, maybe seven, 10,000, who knows how many people are following Christ at this point. This new movement called what we're calling the church. It wasn't called the church at that time. 
but it was what we're calling the church because it's how it all began. So as you know, that began to swell. That's over 10% of the population of Jerusalem. Man, they're, they're starting this new movement and everybody's joining. And so we saw because of that, the religious leaders got upset, so persecution broke out. And we have saw the last two weeks that they were threatened with their lives, they were put in jail. Last week we saw they even, the apostles were flogged, which means they were beaten to within, inch, within an inch of their life, you know, on their backs, their skin was ripped off. It was horrible what they went through. And we ended last week with this scripture. You don't have to turn there. I just want to read it to you to remind you of what we saw after being flogged. Acts chapter 5, verse 41 and 42, it says the apostles left the Sanhedrin. They left those people that had just threatened them and beat them. And they left rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts from house to house, what did they do? They went and said, God, why does this have to happen to us? Where are you right now, God? Why would you? No. No, they didn't do that. It says they went from house to house and back to the temple. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So the question we asked last week is, what do we do with that? That kind of love and devotion, where is that in our lives? We have nothing to be afraid of in following Christ today. Nothing. There's no threat on our lives. There's nothing we have to worry about. And we don't find them huddling together saying, God, where are you? Why aren't you here helping us? They're right back doing what they had began doing. And the church continued to grow and grow. And it overflowed outside of Jerusalem. So this is a point where the, really the church began to develop a hierarchy. We're going to start seeing new characters come into play. Some structure started to begin in in the local church in Jerusalem. And other leaders began to surface. And so if you're reading in Acts, you're going to find one of those leaders was named Stephen. We don't know a lot about Stephen. Because there's a reason we don't know a lot about Stephen. But here's what happened to him. He basically began to join this movement. And he began to be very bold and proclaim the name of Jesus. He was not one of the original apostles. He was not one of those that they were worried about killing in in fear that the people would turn on him. So the Sanhedrin got together, these religious leaders, they got together and said, hey, we can make an example out of Stephen. He's not one of the original apostles. So they arrested him. They actually paid people to make up bad things about him and tell lies about him. And so when they arrest him and they bring him in and they deliver their case to him, he gets the chance to give a defense. His whole defense is written in Acts chapter 7. You can read this for yourself. I'm skipping to Acts chapter 8. But if you want to see Stephen's message, you can read it in Acts chapter 7. It's one of the longest longest messages in the Bible. And he takes his audience from the Old Testament all the way through current times to explain that Jesus is the Messiah. At the end of his message, something happened that I hope never happens at the end of one of my messages. I hope I never have to to experience this. People were so upset, they picked him up, they drug him outside the city, and they stoned him. Please don't ever do that to me. That must have been a pretty harsh message that he delivered. Again, you can read it for yourself. They didn't like what he had to say. So they stoned him. He was the first, really recorded, the first martyr of the church. Once the church began, he's the first one that was put to death. Here's the negative part of that. Once he was killed, and there was no negative response from from the Romans, this kind of opened the door for any enemy of the church, enemy, any enemy of Christians began to persecute them. They saw this as an an opportunity to just go full bore against Christians. So persecution was just breaking out everywhere. And that's where I want to pick up in Luke chapter 8. It's amazing how well this is written. If I'm being honest, if this was a movie, some of you are watching The Chosen. I was talking to someone today about watching. Don't you enjoy The Chosen? Anybody watching that? If you're not watching that, you can download an app free. It's called The Chosen. It's a show you can watch and it's very biblical. Eh, There's some few things that are... They take liberties on, but it's good. 
It's good. If you're not watching that, check it out. I don't know that they even get to this part. I haven't watched that far. But all I know is this would make a great movie. You ever, you ever watched a suspense movie and it begins with like someone dying right at the beginning, so it hooks you right from the beginning. Look at Acts chapter 1. Uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Look at what it says. Saul approved of their killing him. Well, who are they killing? I just explained it. Stephen, the one who delivered the message. They didn't like it. They took him out, stoned him. And here comes Saul. Saul's entering the scene. And so any movie that begins with a killing, it's got you in. So just check out what happens over the next few scriptures as we go through this today. Saul is actually the Hebrew name of the man that we know as Paul. This can get confusing because Saul and Paul are the same person. The same Paul that wrote most of the New Testament, you're going to learn about Saul. He, he's the same guy, but what he did before he ever wrote the New Testament. Pretty amazing the transition that's going to happen here. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, after he approved of the killing of Stephen, it says, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. I find it very interesting that it says they scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, because if you just think back to a few weeks ago when we began this, Jesus, before he left this earth, he appeared to them, and what did he say? He said, you will be my witnesses. Where? In Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And here they are fulfilling exactly what Jesus said. Because they're going to Judea, Samaria, they're spreading out everywhere. These new followers of Jesus were heading for the hills because persecution was happening in Jerusalem. Look at verse 2. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. He was going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Why was he going house to house? Well, that's where these churches were happening. Again, they didn't have a church building. So these were, begin were beginning as small groups, as, as house groups. And so he's going from house to house. He's pulling out these Christians and these leaders, and he's arresting them. His goal was to eliminate this movement. He was ready to get rid of it once, for all, once and for all. And so he spent three years. He spent three years finding Christians, pulling them out, arresting them. Some of them put to death. He was trying to put an end to the church. Have you ever stamped on an anthill? And when you try to demolish an anthill, they just kind of scatter? That's exactly what he was doing. He would go, and once he would start arresting them, and word got out, man, people would just flee. And they were going all over. So actually, he's spreading the gospel even as he's persecuting the church because they're, they're just going everywhere. So look at, I want to look at Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Let's see what happens next. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. What he's really asking from the high priest is permission to begin in Damascus, but he was going to start making his way around outside of Jerusalem into other places, again, eliminating Christians. That's his whole goal. So here we go. He's going after them. Verse 2 says this, that if he found any there who belonged to the way. Now, why am I stopping there? Because we just said this wasn't called a church then. There weren't Christians. They didn't call them Christians. Actually, when they were part of this movement, this Jesus movement, it was actually called the way. Now, lots of scholars, theologians, would love to be able to answer that question for sure. There's been many theories, but many believe the reason that they called this movement the way is because when Jesus would talk, Many times he would say, what? I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Which is, actually, it's an extremely narrow thing to say. Who tries to start a movement and say, by the way, you can't do it at all unless you go through me. That's very narrow. But he's saying, I'm the way. So that's why they believe, why they called this whole movement the way. So, verse 2, let's continue on. So that if Saul found any who were 
who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, if you grew up in Sunday school at all, you know what's about to happen. This is the story of Saul on the way to Damascus. And many know this story. I remember this from like, remember the felt boards in Sunday school? Yeah, I used to love that thing. And uh, I think my mom was probably the teacher at that time. I don't know. I had a couple of Sunday school teachers, but my mom was one at one point. So anyway, I remember this story. Verse three, it said, I told you, pastor's kids got weird growing up. So I remember felt boards. That's how I visualize. But as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, listen to this. Why do you persecute me? Now we're talking about a movement. We're talking about the way. Yet this voice says, not Saul, Saul, why do you persecute the way? Why do you persecute the church? Why do you persecute it? This is Jesus talking and he says, why do you persecute me? Now, if we knew of church the way we see church today, this would have said it differently. This would have been more like, why do you persecute the church? But actually, Jesus is, under, is telling Saul, when you're persecuting the church, you're persecuting me. When you're persecuting the way or this movement, that's me. So Saul says this, he says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, I mentioned at the beginning the idea of kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple. And really, the gospel message is very simple. The four things. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. He was raised. He appeared. But here's something we do when you come to the bridge, and we love having people that sign up to say, we want to be a part of the bridge. We want to serve at the bridge. We're looking for volunteers all the time. One of the things we actually have for people to fill out or just sign really on the back is a leadership honor code. And here's some of the things that it talks about. It has some scripture. It lays out that lifestyles we pursue are love, righteousness, faith, honesty, encouragement, humility. There's things that we want to strive to do in our lives. And then there's things that we want to strive to avoid on the back. And there's a list of some things. Now, it could look like that we're trying to be legalistic and just trying to go, if you don't live by these rules, then you're not perfect and you can't be part of our team. That's not, a, that's not it at all. Just so that we all understand the heart behind this and behind our church, it's this. We, just as Jesus just told Saul, why do you persecute me? This whole way, this movement was representing Christ on the earth. Christ was no longer here. In the same way, today, Christ is not here on this earth. We are the representation we are Christ on this earth. That's why we have such a thing as the leadership honor code and why we say these are things we want to pursue is love, forgiveness, purity, gratitude, grace. We want to avoid certain things, not because it's legalistic, not because it's about rules. It's because we represent Christ. We want to be Christ to those around us. That's the church. I know I've been on this for a few weeks now. And it might seem like, man, he keeps saying the same thing. It's because if you say the same thing differently enough times, it kind of sinks in. And that's what we're going for. We're keeping it simple, but we got to understand that we are Christ on the earth. Again, we could put all we want into this building. It's a building. It's just going to be a building. It could be another furniture store like it was before. We could make it another Pomida if you really want to. It's just going to be a building. We, we are the church and we are the representation of Christ. And so Christ tells him in this moment, he's talking to Saul. He says, why do you persecute me? And then he, Saul says, who is this? Who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus whom you persecuted. He says, now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. This is when Saul's life's about to get to turn upside down. He stands up and he realizes he's blinded. This bright light that had shined in before him blinded him. He can't see a thing. So he gets his helpers to make his way to Damascus, where he was headed, awaiting further instruction from Jesus. And that's where he finds himself, 
blinded by this light, having this moment with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Here we go, Acts chapter 9, verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple. Now, this is a follower of Jesus, not one of the 12 disciples. This is just a follower of Jesus, a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called, him, called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. I love this response from Ananias. He says, Lord, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. In other words, he's saying, are you sure you want me to go? Could you send that guy down the street that's not a very good Christian? Because this guy's killing Christians, and I don't really want to be one of those guys. So Ananias continues. He says, he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. This is such an amazing twist. Again, if this is a movie, it's like taking the worst person, the the, the bad guy out of the movie, and we're about to see him become the good guy. It's like taking Darth Vader from the dark side to the force. Are you with me? All right, if you can visualize that for you Star Wars geeks. This is a message not to just Jewish people. This is a message to the world. It's to Gentiles as well. So this, uh, this whole thing was not just for someone who understood the Old Testament. It was not just a movement for those who were looking for the Messiah. This was for the world, and God chooses the most unlikely person, the one who's been killing Christians, the one who's been arresting them, trying to squash what we call the church. He chose him to be the mouthpiece of the gospel to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 9, verse 16. Jesus says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Wow, I'm sure Ananias was like, thanks, thanks for picking me. I get to deliver this message. The Bible says he goes to Saul. He finds him in the house. They begin to pray together. The Bible tells us that something like scales fall off of Saul's eyes and he can see again. His life was changed in that moment. And I love it. It goes from that. After, after Saul spent several days, uh, verse 19 um, in Acts chapter 9, after Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, here it goes, once, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, his life was changed. And who wouldn't be after experiencing a bright light, being blinded, blinded for three days, having scales fall off your eyes, I'm sure you're going to believe in something that maybe you didn't believe in before. But look at verse 21. It says, all those who heard him were astonished. And they asked, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, this would be a great story. We could just close out right here, pray and go home and say, what an amazing time. Saul was saved. The guy that was killing Christians is no longer doing so. He's now preaching the name of Jesus. But it continues on. The story gets even better. This is when the movie would take it up a notch, if you will. For the next several years, he kind of disappears. We don't see much about Saul. We don't hear much about him. He shows up every once in a while preaching in certain places, but he began to study from the apostles. He he actually tells us, if you read the book of Galatians, which Saul wrote, actually Paul, I should say, because we're going to know it as Paul. Paul wrote that, and it says that he spent two weeks with Peter. He also said that he spent time with James, which is Jesus' brother. But after about 12 to 14 years of preparation, he launched out on what we term as Paul's missionary journey. I put this on the screen for you, and I'm going to leave this up here for a while because I want you to check this out. It shows you. He, he took several journeys on this, and he made this, this whole mission of just going around and starting these churches. After these, this preparation, he launched out on this journey, and for the next 10 or 11, 12 years, he traveled through Turkey and Greece from Jerusalem, and during those years, he would stop at all these cities, and he would just begin to profess the name of Jesus. 
So while the apostles were huddled in Jerusalem, taking care of the church there, he's out starting all these other churches. This is why we have missionaries today. This is why we like hearing about missionaries, because they go into places they haven't been, who haven't heard the name of Jesus, and they try to get the name of Jesus there. That's exactly what Paul was doing. For 10 or so years, 10, 12 years, mostly by ship he traveled. As you can see, he was on the ocean a lot. Mostly by ship, he made three big circles around this area. Everywhere he went, he would go to the synagogue first, and he would convince as many Jews as he could. And once he made them mad and ticked them off, and sometimes they would beat him, they would stone him, they would kick him out, then he would go to the Gentiles in the same area, and he would say, I got good news. This is not just for the Jews. This is for you today. The Bible tells us that around year 58, he was arrested while he was in Jerusalem, and he was taken up to Caesarea, and he was put in prison there for about two years. Now, there's two Caesareas. If you ever look in your Bible maps, there's Caesarea Philippi and Caesarea by the sea. And I want to show you, uh, my wife's going to kill me because anytime I tend to rabbit trail a little bit, it takes a little more time and I have to watch my time and all of that fun stuff. But I got to show this to you because what I like about this is it's very easy to hear this story for me today. You don't read your Bible. Maybe you do. I don't know. But maybe you hear this and you're like, this is a good fairy tale. This sounds good. It's encouraging. But this is real life. This, this happened. And so I had the, the experience two years ago to get to go to Israel and visit some of these places. So I want to show you some of what I was able to see and just help you kind of get a visual of what was going on. So as, as he was arrested, he was taken to Caesarea by the sea. And I want to show you a few things. This would have been Herod's house right here. Now, obviously, everything's eroded over time. So they're doing their best to keep these things nice. But uh, Herod's house would have been right here. If you see this square right here, Herod had a pool that was built up out of the ocean, or out of the sea, excuse me. And he didn't want seawater in that. He wanted fresh water. So there's an aqueduct that was built up on the mountains that he had slaves built for years. And that would bring fresh water down to this pool that he had behind his house. That's all that's left is it's pretty much right at sea level now. But it used to be built up. And that was right behind Herod's house, which was here. Now, this right here was called the Hippodrome. That is where they would have what we know as the Olympics. Back in the day, they would have their chariot races and all those kinds of things. So there were stands. I'll show you another picture in a moment along one side. And that's where they would be able to watch. This right down here was Herod's Colosseum. So go to the next picture. You can see a closer look. That's the Colosseum where they would host, you know, plays and those kinds of things. And then the next picture will show you the Hippodrome. So if, as you can see, they could sit along the side here and watch as they had these uh, Olympic-type events right there by Herod's house. And the last thing I want to show you, this is uh, right next, there's the hippodrome right over here, and right next to it, these were prison cells. And one of these cells would be where Paul spent two years once he was arrested. And we're going to find that he wrote some of the New Testament sitting in one of these right here. This is what he lived in for two years. Again, a lot of it's gone. Uh, he couldn't just step out and walk over to the ocean or the sea. He actually, there was walls there, but you can see where he spent his time. So this is real life. This is not some fairy tale that we just like to hear about. The reason it's hard for us to picture this is because we're talking about Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. We, we can handle that. But wait a minute, he was raised? What? He, he came back to life? But that fourth thing that we talked about, the reps, that he appeared. We're going to get to that in just a moment. I like to make sure that we understand this just isn't some fairy tale that kind of gives us something to live on. This is life, and this happened. And so that's why I wanted to show you this. Paul let them know he was a Roman citizen, and he wanted to be tried by Rome. So while in prison, again, he wrote letters to Ephesus, which is why we have Ephesians. He wrote letters to Philippi, which is why we have Philippians. He wrote letters to his churches while sitting in prison. After two years, he was released. In 66, he was re-arrested again. Same reason, same reason every time because he had been traveling and spreading the name of Jesus. Nero was emperor at this time. He hated Christians. And so after about a year, year and a half, 
around 67, at some point Paul was brought out of his prison cell. There was no witnesses to this. Silently, they walked him outside the city and he was beheaded. Done. Again, trying to eliminate what we call the church. But the impact of his life had really just begun. Every single day, whether you realize it or not, there's probably a scripture that comes to mind or that comes up in front of you, if you read it all, that probably are the words of Paul. The words written, not of him saying, God, God, why'd you forsake me and put me in a place like this prison? God, why did I have to spend so much time there? I want you to hear his words after living the life that he did. And I bring that up to you to help you understand too that, that very, very, very bad things happen to very, very, very good people. But can I remind you that God is still on the throne? He is not shaken by that. He is not surprised by that. It's hard for us to understand sometimes, but God is not changed by that. There is no mystery. Never throughout the book of Acts do we find Christians huddled together feeling like God has lost control. And with Paul's boldness, his courage, his tenacity to get on a boat time after time, even hitting the same area just three different times, he, he kind of made the same circle. It's beginning the global church. It's beginning the Gentile church, if you will, because it wasn't just a message to Jews. He was able to take what was written to Jewish people and transfer that to a Gentile world. And so in the book of Corinthians, he gives us a synopsis of this message, of what we're talking about today. And for those who don't have the Old Testament background, who weren't raised uh, looking for the Messiah or very well versed in Scripture, this is what he wrote to 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians to his church at Corinth. Paul's words right here. I love this because, again, he's kissed. He, he remembered that. Even though that wasn't phrased until Navy in 1960, Paul knew kiss. He knew how to keep it simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Look at what he says. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. Everybody say the gospel. The gospel. It's the good news. Paul says, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. In other words, everything I've given you, you might lose sight of something. Don't lose sight of this. This is the most important thing. If you forget everything else, don't forget this. Here it is. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. He says that Christ died for our sins, according to scripture. That he was buried, that he was raised, and that on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas. Who's Cephas? Anybody? It's Peter. But I want you to see the long list of people we're going to go through as he starts talking about Christ died, he was buried, he was raised, he appeared. That's our reps, right? Christ died, he was buried, he was raised, he appeared. If you get caught up on anything else, let it go. You keep this part. This is the most important. He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Verse 6, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Jesus didn't just appear to two or three people and it was like, well, was that a vision? Could that have been something else? No. 500 people that Jesus appeared to. And what's Paul say here? He says, most of whom are still living. At the time that he's saying this, he's saying most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. So what he's saying to his people are, you have a hard time believing this? Just go ask. Just go find some of these people. That's what he was doing when he was preparing himself for his missionary journey, is he was talking to the disciples. He was talking to those who witnessed it. who are still living at this time. You have trouble believing, just go ask them. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And here's the last one. Last of all, he appeared to me, to one 
abnormally born, for I am the least of the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle. The apostle Paul, the one who we read almost on a daily basis, giving us direction on how to be the church, giving us direction on how to live a Christian life, says, I don't deserve to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. Verse 10, this is powerful. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me is not without effect. You talk about somebody that needed the grace of God. Have any of us been around killing Christians? Anybody in here going around trying to squash the church? Anybody around here feeling bad for that? No. Yet here's a man who needed grace beyond grace, if you will. He was enemy number one of the way or the church that we call it. And he says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Is it not the same for you and me? I know I stand here today and tell you I am what I am by the grace of God. What a life he lived. Being the enemy, but then turning to become one of the most profound writers of the gospel. Tell me God didn't have a plan. Tell me God didn't know what was going on. And Paul brings us this message today, this very simple message. To those of you, again, maybe don't have any background in church, those, those of you who maybe didn't know what it meant to be looking for the Messiah, it's, it's the reps. Christ died for us. He was buried. He was raised and he appeared. If you can believe that, it doesn't matter. If you can believe that, the Bible says you're in. That's what it shows us. Keeping it simple. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised. He appeared. Don't get caught up in, was it seven literal days in creation? Where are the dinosaurs? You know, the, don't get caught up in those things. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised. He appeared. Don't get caught up in revelation. What, what's it mean with all the horses and all the heads and all the things? We'll all have questions. Let's be honest. If you wrestle with anything, please, I beg you, don't wrestle because of what Christians have done to you in the past. Don't wrestle with the idea of Christianity because of what the church has done to you in the past. Do you believe that Christ died for your sins? Do you believe that he was buried, raised, and that he appeared? If Saul or Paul were here today, he'd say, just go ask those who are still alive that saw it. Unfortunately, we don't have that, that opportunity. We don't, we don't have that available to us. They're dead and gone. And here's the truth. It won't be long. You and I will no longer be here. But the church will continue. And it's by the grace of God that you are who you are and that I am who I am. So will you bow your heads with me? Maybe you haven't been persecuting the church. Maybe you haven't uh, been against God, been enemy number one. But is there anything in your life that you've allowed other people or yourself to tell you, I'm not worthy? Have you allowed something over the years of the church being the church, have you allowed those rules, those guidelines to get in your way and, real, and, and been believing that, that you're not worthy, you're not able to be forgiven? There's something you've done that's too wrong. Can I tell you, you're no worse than Saul. You're no worse than me. You're no worse than anybody else in this room. Keep it simple. Christ died. He was buried. He was raised. He appeared. And he did all of that for you. There is nothing you've done, no matter what anybody else on this earth has told you, there is nothing you have done that cannot be removed from your heart. So if you're sitting here today and you're saying, Chad, I, 
I really, I, I've prayed this prayer before, but I don't know that I've ever truly believed it. I've heard these stories before. I kind of thought it was, it was more of a fairy tale. It was more of just something that somebody liked to live by to help them have good values and morals. No, this is real life. If you're saying, Chad, I, I hear the Holy Spirit tugging at my heart right now, and I need to just ask Jesus into my heart. I need to ask for forgiveness today. If that's you, I'm just going to ask that you lift your hand. This is not for me. You're lifting your hand to Jesus to say, I surrender to you right now. Anyone? Here's where we leave this. I didn't see a hand, so if you raised your hand and I didn't see it, I would encourage you to pray in this moment. Maybe you're watching online and you feel a sense to pray right now. I'm going to encourage you to do that. And for the rest of us, can we just think about for the moment the good news, what Paul called the gospel and how we as individuals, as representation of Jesus Christ on this earth, are to take that gospel outside this building. For so long, it's been something we come in to celebrate and then we leave and forget about. We come in and celebrate, we leave and forget about. We come in and celebrate, we leave and forget about. It's time for this to be your life. It's time for this to be the number one, the priority in your life. Just as Paul said, no matter what else you, you think about, forget all those things. The first priority is this, Christ died. He was buried, he was raised, he appeared. Keep it simple. Don't allow those things to stop you from sharing the gospel because you feel unworthy. Don't allow everything around you, the distractions of this world, to keep you from doing what God has called you to do, and that's to be Jesus Christ outside this building. So Father, to every one of us listening to my voice today, whether online or in person, here we are, God. We are your people, and it is only by your grace that we are who we are. And we thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to die for, you, for us. Lord, that we can be forgiven today. That we can walk in freedom today. But I pray that as we walk in freedom, we walk out of this building, not seeing this building as the church, but walking out of this building, being the church, being Christ to those around us. It's the purpose behind all of this. It's why the whole thing began back in the first century. is so that your church could continue. So use us, I pray, in Jesus' name. And with everybody in agreement, can we all just say amen? Amen. Amen. Will you stand to your feet? We're going to worship God one more time before we leave this place.